show that they, their ability to transmit it to others is as, is as reduced as possible. Is there any other information that Chinese authorities and WHO will be trying to gather as new cases arrive? Uh, well, I think the origin of the virus is very important. You know, clearly, if it's jumped once, it can jump again. And so if we need to know where it came from and how it got into the primary individuals. The second thing we need to know is the magic number called R0, which is a, a measure of the infectivity of the virus in the human population. How easy does it get from the primary infected person to other people? Right, so that's it. We're starting. Wow, you guys are very efficient. Luckily for us... I found a researcher whose own focus is looking at exactly that. So my name's Rosalind Ego. I'm an assistant professor of infectious disease modelling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I started by asking Rosalind about what we need to know to calculate this so-called magic number. The key information for understanding the transmissibility of the virus is, is starting to come out now and over the next few weeks will be the critical information. And what we're trying to understand is something called the reproduction number which is the average number of secondary cases that each infected person generates. So how many people does each person infect? And if that number is greater than one, then the epidemic will increase. And if it's less than one, then the epidemic will decrease. And so right now, we're, we, we don't really know what that value is. And over the next week or two, if we start seeing these epidemics or we start seeing outbreaks in other cities, we start seeing chains of transmission, we'll get to know that a lot better. That's it for part one. After the break, we'll be hearing more from Rosalind about how we can start to understand exactly how infectious the new coronavirus is. Welcome back. With increasing numbers of people infected by the new coronavirus, epidemiologists around the world are working overtime to calculate what Ian termed earlier the magic number. This tells us, on average, how many people each person with the virus will pass it on to. Bearing in mind that there could be plenty of people infected who don't feel very sick or who haven't gone to hospital, I asked Rosalind how you figure out what this number is in practice. So that's what we do in our work is we take some of these unknowns, like what are the fraction of people that are reported, what are the fraction of people with severe symptoms, and we use as much data as we can. For instance, if you follow, as they're doing in China, you follow a case and their contacts, and you see how many of those people get infected, and then you follow their contacts, etc. And so these kind of methods can help you understand the average number of secondary cases that each person infects. But an important thing about all infections all pathogens is that from person to person there's variation in the number of secondary cases that each person generates. So for a lot of people it might be less than one or so zero new infections but there might be some people within the population that for a variety of reasons infect more people and that will bring your average up above one. You were saying that there's a lot of different factors that come into how quickly something like this spreads. How do you go about collecting that data and what are you asking for? What kind of level of detail do you get information from hospitals, say? So the information that's being collected is things like when did the person get ill? When did they first seek care? How many people did they meet in that time window and before? And we're really interested in kind of the epidemiological details like that that are being collected. And what we want to generate is a time series. So that's number of cases per day that occur. And that can help us understand if the reproduction number is above one or not. Because if, the, if you have a time series, so number of cases per day going along for a month, if that number starts to increase, that tells us the reproduction number is above one. And how quickly it increases allows us to calculate how high above one it is. And I suppose another factor in figuring out how many people have been infected is how severe it is and whether everyone who gets it gets very ill and goes to hospital or whether some people maybe just feel slightly not themselves. How do you figure that out if there's this kind of big pool of people who've got it and not really having strong symptoms? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So when you see a new virus, you're likely at the very beginning to see the most severe cases. So those people who've gone to hospital with the most severe symptoms may have died and have caused the health authorities to wonder what's going on. But really, it's like a pyramid with the most severe cases at the top, the moderately severe in the middle, and potentially cases that are much less severe, even asymptomatic at the bottom. So we don't know the shape of that pyramid for this infection. We don't know if the cases that you see at the top are most of them or whether there is quite a wide base to this pyramid and there's lots of cases. And that's something that we don't know right now. And it really um, is really difficult to calculate initially. And it also means that it's very difficult for us to calculate the case fatality ratio. So this is the number of people that um, die from the infection for each infected case. And so early in the epidemic, when you know you're only seeing the most severe ones, and a lot of the people that you see, you don't know yet the outcome of their infection. And so it can be really difficult to calculate the case fatality ratio early on. And that's something that people are going to focus on now to understand really how bad this, this virus is. Based on early reports, it looks like this new virus could be affecting people less severely than SARS, the coronavirus that killed more than 700 people between 2002 and 2003. I wanted to know from Rosalind whether we should be reassured by this information or whether there's still a possibility that if the new coronavirus is more contagious, the outcome could still be very serious. So for SARS, the um, reproduction number at the start of the epidemic was between two and three, so fairly high. But the aim of control measures and the interventions that we do to try and stop transmission aim to push this number down. So it changes through time. And we have the basic reproduction number, which is the number of secondary cases generated in the absence of any interventions and in the absence of any immunity in the population. And then we have the effective reproduction number, which is the reproduction number through time as some people are infected, as there's interventions, and as we try and stop the epidemic. And so that's what we're trying to push below one so that on average, each person infects less than one new person. What measures can you take to push that down and stop people transmitting it to each other? So a crucial piece of information for understanding how controllable this this and other viruses will be is to say how much of the transmission that each infected person does happens before they know that they're infected. Because for something like the flu, you tend to become infectious about a day before you get ill. And so even if you said to people, oh, you know, don't go out, go see your doctor as soon as you get ill, they will have done some of their transmission before that happened. And what we don't know for this virus yet is if it's similar to flu or if it's similar to other infections where you don't start to become infectious till you know you're ill. And in that case, it can be easier to control because then people with symptoms may suspect they're infected and might change their behaviour to decrease their number of contacts or to seek care as quickly as possible. And presumably people's behaviour can change that as well. And, you know, it's Chinese New Year coming up at the end of the week. There's going to be lots of people travelling. There's going to be big family gatherings. Presumably that's sort of the ideal conditions for transmitting this kind of virus. Yeah, so for directly transmitted viruses like this, when people mix together, obviously they can't spread it from person to person. And so then, as has been advised, people should take hygienic measures, for instance, like coughing into your elbow, not going out if you're ill. Um, And now the Chinese authorities have asked people not to travel from Wuhan, which may slow things down. But it's really critical at this point, do we know that there is sustained human-to-human transmission? And if there is, then these travel changes might have a bigger effect. For influenza, for example, decisions can be taken to close schools. One could stop public gatherings. And if you want, you can close workplaces to try and decrease the contacts that people have between people. But it's important to also remember the other effects that this has on society, because not only does it cost a lot to do that, But those people who are no longer at school or work might mix together anyway. Then it's a less effective intervention. So there are things that we can do. With SARS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, Ebola and avian flu all emerging in recent years, I wanted to know whether outbreaks of new diseases are becoming more common or with better tests they've simply got easier to spot. 
Yeah, it's hard to know whether it's become more common or we just know more about it now. When people and animals interact, there's always the chance of this happening. It's happened throughout history. And there's things that do increase the risk of people and animals coming into contact. Through the changing climate, there's more interaction between wild animals and people where those animal habitats and where people live come closer together. There's also more people, so there's just more animals needed for agriculture and livestock and for people's livelihoods now. So there's more people in contact with animals than there ever has been. However, this is just something that happens. It's happened through SARS, the flu virus that happened in 2009, that was also from animals. Ebola is a spillover infection. And even HIV originally came from semen immunodeficiency virus, which is an animal disease. So it's always happened. Since SARS, there's been, if you like, an open mind to the possibility that a new respiratory infection could be a coronavirus. And so I think that open-minded policy is very important. And the other thing to note is, of course, China has been afflicted by a number of avian flu outbreaks over recent years, particularly from so-called H7 influenzas. And again, they are very well attuned now to being able to track down where new infections have occurred and to determine what the sequences are of the agents involved. So it's been a very good way to handle what is perhaps occasionally an inevitable situation. As we're recording, the World Health Organization is meeting to decide whether to declare an international public health emergency. This is a fast-moving story, and there's still so much that we don't know. In the coming days, there will be countless news reports updating the numbers of people and countries affected by the virus. But it's worth remembering that behind every story, there are doctors collecting information from patients, hospital labs analysing samples, and scientists around the world working to understand the nature of this virus and how deadly it is likely to be. It is only through this collective global effort that we can protect ourselves against dangerous new diseases and be better prepared for next time one strikes. That's it for this week. We'll include links to some of our coverage of the new coronavirus at theguardian.com. We'll certainly be watching any developments closely here at Science Weekly. Thanks to Ian Jones and Rosalind Ego. If you have any thoughts or feedback, feel free to send us an email at scienceweekly at theguardian.com. This episode was presented by me, Hannah Devlin, and was produced by Madeline Finley. For more great podcasts from The Guardian, just go to theguardian.com slash podcasts.